Welcome, and thank you for tuning in for the Lake Houston Area Chamber's Focus on Federal Government Lunch-In with U.S. Congressman Kevin Brady. I'm Terry Vaughn, District Manager of Pharmacy and Retail Operations for Walgreens and the 2020 Lake Houston Area Chamber Board Chair. You will notice that you're muted, and all guests will remain muted throughout the program. If you have questions or need assistance, please use the chat function located at the bottom of your screen. Today, we will hear an update from Congressman Brady, followed by questions submitted from members in advance. If time allows, we will provide an opportunity for Congressman Brady to answer a few audience questions through the chat function. If your question is not answered today, the Congressman staff will follow up with you to provide an answer. We are grateful to be joined today by Congressman Kevin Brady, who is the U.S. Representative for Texas's 8th Congressional District, serving since 1997. Congressman Brady is the lead Republican on the House Ways and Means Committee, considered by many to be the most powerful committee in Congress with jurisdiction over taxes, health care, Social Security, Medicare, international trade, and welfare. While serving as chairman, Brady authored and helped pass the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which reformed the U.S. tax code for the first time in more than 30 years, leading to millions of jobs being created, record revenue to the U.S. Treasury, the lowest employment rate in almost 50 years, and the highest wage growth in a decade. Prior to his election to Congress, Brady worked as a Chamber of Commerce executive for 18 years and served six years in the Texas House of Representatives, where he was named one of the 10 best legislators for families and children. Now, we welcome Congressman Brady. Terry, thanks very much for having me as part of the luncheon. I like that. To Jenna, thanks for your leadership as well. Uh, this chamber is a remarkable chamber, I think is such a clear voice for the businesses in so many different areas. We've had an opportunity to work together on so many other issues. Terry, I know as chairman, you are, you know, this is uh, quite a year to be leading this business community, but you also see this firsthand from the pharmacy as well. And you know, uh, as I do, I think all of us on this Zoom today, you know, this is uh, the most unprecedented challenge most of us will face in our lifetime to have the, con uh, the country hit with uh, both a, a major healthcare pandemic as well as an, an economic challenge the likes we haven't seen really uh, since the depression. Uh, it's taken an unprecedented response. First, back here at home, I really credit our healthcare leaders and communities and providers our business community, the Chamber of Commerce, our local elected uh, leaders and state legislators and our emergency responders all working together to make sure that our region uh, would not be overwhelmed by this virus. And in fact, they've succeeded at that task as we start to begin slowly and cautiously uh, to reopen. It also took an unprecedented response from the president and Congress. As you know, we 
uh, quickly, passed four bipartisan bills with limited, I think, partisan uh, uh, foolishness. We did have two delays the last two bills, but, but found a way to get the job done. As you know, the first bill was all about accelerating vaccines and treatments for those who get the virus. And you're seeing that payoff now. We already have 63 different tests. Uh, they're being uh, approved more than 70 separate treatments for those who, <clears throat> who get the coronavirus and, and need uh, more serious treatment. Two vaccines already in, in clinical trials and more of them in the pipeline, some of them from right here uh, in the Houston region. Second bill is all about making sure everyone could get tested without cost, that states could start to get unemployment dollars to gear up for what we knew would be record levels of joblessness and making sure that if you got the virus or someone you love did that you wouldn't lose your pay as you go home to take care of them. The third and the fourth bills are the ones I think we're all familiar with, the CARES bill and the follow-up to that. My role as lead Republican was to work on the tax issues, the unemployment issues with the White House and Senate, uh, as well as about half of the healthcare issues, mainly how we reimburse to our local hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, all that. And so the CARES Act, a little over $2 trillion, main focus was recognizing that for our economy, this is a cash flow crisis uh, of no one's making. And the goal was to inject much, as much cash as, pos cash as possible as quickly into businesses, large or small, to help them ride this out and then to keep their workers employed during this process because we know that we will rebound and how successful we are keeping those businesses alive, your businesses alive, and those workers connected to, to the job is really key to that economic rebound. And so you saw both the, uh, the, independent, the economic checks that went out to families, just economic support to help them ride this out. Uh, on the tax side, we deferred the payroll taxes, uh, allowed businesses to take their losses right now for the last three years and file them again to bring cash back. Our thinking was that alone, those two things would leave a half a trillion dollars into uh, local businesses accounts rather than sending them to Washington. We think that's important. But we also, as you saw, made a huge commitment for lending and the Paycheck Protection Program. So we were determined for a lot of our businesses, uh, medium-sized and larger, they need, needed the capital to be able to ride this out. And that we, we think about uh, our airlines. We're in a region where so many of our workers uh, work at, the, at uh, uh, the airport, are connected to it in some way. Crucial, we kept them, if not flying, uh, at least uh, riding this out uh, to be able to be in a position when the, the economy recovers. You saw it in uh, the energy industry. We continue, members of us from Texas, from energy states, excuse me, continue to work with the White House uh, on making sure we can provide the lending for our energy industry. It's a diverse one. They all come at it from a di slightly different perspective. So the goal has been to tailor lending to make sure whether you're the largest of the large, a refiner, a, a pipeline, an oil uh, and gas service company, or a small producer, we have tens of thousands of them, that there would be a way for you to borrow that money to ride this crisis out. And in this case, as you know, with energy, it's going to take longer. We're talking not months, but years. But it's key that we keep as many of those businesses and their workers alive right now. We also sent down uh, additional dollars for state and local governments, hospitals, uh, colleges, our local colleges and schools, all of whom had to adjust on a dime their curriculum and relationships with their students. We also sent dollars down for disaster aid, for first responders, for transit, for housing, economic development. Overall, it doesn't get much attention but throughout this uh, crisis, Congress has sent over $765 billion down to state and local communities to help them ride this out. In the final bill, we replenished, again, there was a 16-day delay that shouldn't have happened, 
but we managed to bring everyone together, uh, replenish the Paycheck Protection Program, add more money to the economic injury disaster loans, more dollars we saw would be needed for our local hospitals uh, and healthcare providers. Plus, we believe now with more companies producing the testing and more of them approved, we added $25 billion to try to accelerate, continue to accelerate that testing down to the state in local level. For us, uh, my role uh, beyond uh, helping no negotiate with the House and in the, with the Senate and the White House on that, my two roles have been to try to make sure that those programs are executed right, especially the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, look, I don't, I don't know how President Trump's White House got that program out in seven days, uh, a, a, frankly, a miracle. I appreciated that they um, placed speed over perfection because it was crucial to get it out as evidenced by how quickly it was drawn down. You know, the demand is just as heavy for the second round as well. Uh, and there are adjustments in fine, none of this is perfect. The adjustments in fine tuning need to be made. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has been, I think incredibly uh, thoughtful about listening to our, what we believe needs to be changed. Also, he's been pretty clear, some of these changes Congress needs to do. Uh, that's what the law says. And so we are right now working together at looking at some of the fine tuning on that paycheck protection program. In the first round, uh, Texas was the number one uh, receiver of those small business forgivable loans. Uh, in, and in that round, um, I forget the exact number of loans, but it saved almost 3 million uh, workers, kept them on the payroll at their small business. In the second round, uh, it is us, California and Florida that lead. Uh, and here's what's interesting. In the first round overall, despite the media attention on a few larger companies, the average paycheck protection loan was about $206,000. So that is a business of about 25 to 35 workers. In the second round, it's even smaller. The average loan is about $79,000. That tells me that our independent contractors, self-employed, uh, our freelancers, our gig workers are, are beginning to get those loans as well. Most of these loans are coming from our local banks. And I can just tell you uh, having held several conference calls with our community banks in Texas. They have devoted an incredible amount of time to processing these loans, working through the technical challenges that always come up in, in pushing a, a loan program into existence this quickly. They still continue to put in unbelievable hours. So they have been, uh, they have done remarkable work. And again, it is those small businesses that are getting the loans and small banks who are providing the loans. And without them, um, I think we'd be in deep trouble today. We have more work to do. I'm on the President's Task Force for Reopening the Economy from the Ways and Means Committee. And, and I think the President is absolutely right. We not only can reopen the economy, but we have to. And we have to do it smart by continuing to keep maximum pressure on the virus. But while reopening, with safe and healthy workplaces, uh, doing it in a way, Texas Governor Abbott is reopening in phases, doing it gradually, keeping an eye on uh, the cases, the testing, the hospitalizations, all those key elements as he reopens. My fear uh, was that if we had continued to lock down the US economy, we would have hurt an awful lot more Americans. Those who are jobless today, uh, those who would have faced an unnecessarily prolonged economic recession if we hadn't begun to unlock parts of the, of the economy in a responsible way. And frankly, look, um, work is where you get your benefit, healthcare benefits, your retirement benefits, where you tend to get the most money, you know, and it, frankly, it's unhealthy to be unemployed for long periods of time. So I think that was crucial. Uh, I'll finish with this. So as we look at reopening, 
Uh, I'm holding a number of the Ways and Means Republicans. I'm talking to our my Democrat chairman, Rich Neal from Massachusetts, also speaking pretty regularly to job creators, NFIB, manufacturers, technology, businesses around the country and in Texas, including energy, um, and our members about how best we can help it reopen the economy. Uh, a couple, our, our priorities from the Ways and Means Republican. First, uh, we need to make work pay. Um, the unemployment benefits that Congress approved uh, was a compromise from the Senate from what Democrats were insisting on 100% wage replacement. So you get the, paid the same whether you worked or didn't work, which is a recipe for a prolonged recession. Um, in the end, the Senate and the White House compromised on $600 per week. But even then, and, and we raised this red flag at the time, for about half of American workers, you would get paid more to be unemployed than at work. That's not healthy for an economic rebound. Makes it really difficult for local businesses to hire, rehire, you know, gear themselves up. And so uh, my top priority for reopening the economy in the next package will be to redesign the unemployment benefit. Um, in fact, to, to turn it into a return to work bonus, where when workers are offered their job back, in a healthy and safe workplace that they actually get an incentive to return to work and begin uh, to rebound in this economy. Second priority is that we believe uh, there may needs to be some tax help uh, to help companies uh, reconfigure their plants, their stores, their office spaces uh, to offset the cost of increased testing, uh, protective gear, all, all that goes with that. So we've developed a tax credit focused on healthy workplaces. And then many lessons learned from this virus, I'll completely end here, take questions, is that um, we now know that America needs to be medically, more medically independent on key medicines, on crucial medical supplies, on the ingredients for these medicines and supplies, as well as the research, uh, too much of it, is done in with unreliable partners like China. And so we developed a tax package to incentivize businesses to bring those production lines back to America, if not all uh, the major parts of it, so that uh, we can rely on this on our own uh, medical uh, resources going forward, especially for pharmaceuticals that we can't stockpile, for medical equipment for the most vulnerable, and the needs we have for our defense department need to be reliable, need to be dependable. And it may take a few years to do that, but we've developed uh, tax incentives, what we say medicines made in America proposal that would help bring those back. White House supports uh, those priorities. Uh, we're gonna continue to work with them. So with that, Terry, Jen, I'd be glad to take questions or comments on, on the reopening, what more we can do to help, I uh, would love to have your advice and guidance. You've always been terrific for me uh, throughout the years we've worked together. Thank you, Congressman Brady. Yeah, now we'll ask a few questions that were submitted by our members in advance of this luncheon. First, yesterday it was announced that Roche won emergency approval from the FDA for an antibody test to determine whether people have ever been infected with the coronavirus. How critically important do you feel antibody testing is as we move forward with reopening the economy? You know, I think it is, great question. I think it is one tool. Uh, we are learning more about this virus every day. I will tell you it would have been incredibly helpful if China would not have covered up that disease early on, held it, withheld the data from US inspectors, alerted the rest of the world, I think we could be in a better place today. Nonetheless, every day we learn more, uh, certainly uh, understanding how much of the population has already been uh, infected or exposed to it would tell us more about what the rates of, not just infection, but those with more symptom, serious symptoms and those who are hospitalized. I also think too, that there is no one size fits all for uh, businesses reopening. 
Uh, for some businesses, uh, initial testing will be important. Uh, protective gear and masks, uh, temperature, uh, wands, uh, reconfiguring workplaces. Uh, for others, uh, my son's a welder with a business in family owned business in Magnolia. They're never within six feet of each other except for lunch. They wear protective gear. Their issue for reopening is client customers. They need those projects turned back on. And so I think we will need all the above those types of tests, the antivirals uh, to treat those who are hospitalized and have the symptoms now. The vaccines ultimately are going to be key. So this is really uh, never a one size fits all um, issue. All of these things are helpful. Thank you. Of the $75, uh, $75 billion allocated to hospitals and healthcare providers in the last legislative uh, legislation that passed, what percentage will go to rural hospitals versus urban hospitals? And why is this critical to our recovery? Yeah, great question. So uh, you ought to probably look at the two uh, um, big amounts of dollars we sent to hospitals and healthcare providers together. The first one was $100 billion. The second is 75. Uh, in the first uh, tranche, and in, in I, on the phone, meet with Secretary of Health and Human Services at least once a week. The four top leaders in healthcare from the House and the top four from the Senate are on the phone on this funding. The first round went out to hospitals based on their Medicare fee-for-service from the past year. The second round went to a broader group, including rural hospitals, our community clinics, our children's hospitals, pediatricians, a broader uh, group of um, healthcare providers. $10 billion in that, that, that first group, is reserved for our rural hospitals and rural clinics. There's dollars reserved also for those with a disproportion, disproportionately higher share of the uninsured. We have a lot of that in Texas. Uh, and there will be yet uh, more phases of dollars sent down in that first 100 billion dollars. The administration has not identified yet how that second 75 will be spent, but my guess is uh, they are observing who's getting the dollars, looking for any gaps. Those rural hospitals, we raise that issue early on because in our, my congressional district, certainly yet we have five rural hospitals, some critical access hospitals. They struggle in the best of times and could easily be go under uh, in this virus, especially as we've cut off, or not we, but as elective surgeries have been cut off and other sources of revenue, it's made it very difficult for them. So the short answer is uh, at least 10 billion currently for rural, there will be more. We're going to stay on top of that because that, frankly, uh, all of our healthcare providers, our nursing homes, our rural clinics, our uh, federally health qualified healthcare clinics, these are all crucial during this, this crisis. The most vulnerable always are the rural. Yeah, absolutely. State and local governments have asked for support, which was not included in the bill. Senate Majority uh, Leader McConnell has said that Congress should press the pause button on any new aid. Will Congress approve spending to support beleaguered state and local governments? Yeah, great question. The short answer is we already have. Uh, as I noted, we've identified over 765 billion, that's three quarters of a trillion dollars for state and local communities. That's more than we're giving to small businesses um, with the Paycheck Protection uh, Program. Those dollars, for example, $150 billion direct aid to state and local communities uh, we are sending dollars down for, as I said, unemployment, hospitals, economic development, housing, disaster aid, first responders. I know the national media doesn't uh, like to admit this, but we have sent a remarkable amount already. I think one of the, before we send more money, let's assess how it's working. For example, uh, we committed $400 million to the city of Houston. 
to help them with their coronavirus expenses and all the costs associated with it. Another uh, large amount to Harris County as well, Montgomery County, 105 billion. Yeah, I think it's really crucial. Those dollars will, I think, far exceed the, their healthcare costs. So we are going to make sure local taxpayers don't pick up those costs. Uh, secondly, uh, some states, uh, unfortunately, the governors are not sharing those dollars with the smaller communities as Congress intended. Um, and there will be no additional dollars for states uh, if they are hoarding the dollars we sent to the small communities and not passing them on. Um, in Texas, Governor Abbott has taken a different approach. The, within the first three days of getting the announcement that we would get $11 billion, he announced that he would be putting a uh, program together for smaller cities and counties to be able to draw down those dollars to help them offset those costs. He's waiting for some guidance from the Secretary of Treasury to do that, but he, our governor has done it exactly right. A lot have not. And so, yeah, it is, uh, I think Leader McConnell was right to say, let's pause. Let's look to see how these dollars, who's getting them uh, and how they're working before we spend another trillion dollars, because we have a, a lot of needs uh, in this country, whether it is testing, whether it's protective gear, reopening the economy, our healthcare community. And so I, I too uh, believe let's, let's make sure these dollars are getting to where Congress intended. Yeah, thank you. That, that kind of brings us into our next question. So uh, the federal debt had already climbed to over 22.5 trillion by the end of quarter four, 2019, with a debt to GDP ratio before the COVID-19 economic shutdown of 106.7%. This is before the phase one through four pandemic response stimulus bills. How concerned should Americans be about this level of national debt? Well, I think concerned. Uh, we certainly were before this virus hit. The good news is because of tax reform, we had the strongest economy in the planet. Uh, people were going back to work, wages were going up. And so we had two of the highest revenue uh, uh, years in, in American history. In other words, our tax revenues were going up at four and 6% a year. That's a very strong clip. The problem was, is that our spending is outpacing that. Um, some of it, to rebuild the military uh, as was needed, and I, and I supported that all the way. But the bulk of our spending is going to a handful of programs that are so important, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, issues like that, programs that are crucial for millions of Americans, financially those shaky. I, I think the answer is even now especially because of the spending we've had to do to try to keep, keep this economy from collapsing and our healthcare system from being overwhelmed, that there is no question, both parties are going to have to come together with a plan to begin to lower this debt, get us back, as you said, into more of a balance between what the government spends and what our economy is. I do think it was absolutely uh, crucial to keep our small businesses and our workers working. Uh, but boy, it, it has come at a cost. And uh, to be responsible, we're going to have to find a way, both parties together, uh, to try to constrain costs over time while we get this economy uh, revved back up. Thank you, Congressman Brady. I also have a question here from the audience. Um, any hope for the nonprofits to get included uh, in payroll protection? I sure hope so. We, uh, the first round on the CARES Act had nonprofits, but it didn't include chambers of commerce, didn't include economic development organizations. The U.S. Chamber took, so that issue came to the Senate fairly late in the process. Uh, U.S. Chamber took the lead to try to, to wedge that in ways and means. Republicans, my staff, got them the language to do that addition. For some reason, it just wasn't accepted in that CARES Act at the time. Uh, we took another run at it to push for it in this additional round. But as you know, 
no changes were made to the Paycheck Protection Act, there is still, I think, very strong political support for doing this. My worry is, you know, when, when, when do we get another chance to change this in the law? You don't want it to be too late to help our chambers of commerce and our local development organizations ride this out. Does it like, look like any business, being an old chamber executive myself, look, memberships are uh, an important part of your revenue, but so are all your special events. And if they have fallen during this crucial last two months, they didn't exist. It can create major crash, uh, cash crunches for our, our nonprofits uh, and why, you know, we've got to get that changed sooner or later. And just look to be clear too, uh, a number of nonprofits were included in the original carriers. This was an oversight that in my view, uh, they sh it should have been accepted and should have been added in there. Thank you. I have uh, one more uh, question from the audience, and that's, uh, do you, would you like to share your thoughts on the way the various county judges have handled decisions um, as it relates to this coronavirus? Well, look, um, let's start from, from the bigger picture. So Texas, I think, has done uh, a very good job. We are the second in population. Uh, we're only ninth in cases, uh, our growth in new cases is slowing down. Our hospitalizations are not just flattening, but coming down as well. Our testing is gearing up pretty significantly, which I think is key. I, I believe that that is a combination of decisions from the governor, Governor Abbott, as well as our state and local leaders. Uh, these are tough calls. Uh, I wouldn't do uh, everything. I, I didn't think uh, the requirement of masks with the penalty, it, it, it's not only was it an overreach, but secondly, uh, actually wasn't the CDC guidelines for what you and I need to both keep ourselves safe and others safe uh, in the public square. Nonetheless, you know, I think our state and local leaders have, uh, uh, along with our healthcare community, have had to make very difficult decisions with not nearly the information I think they would have liked. And just as I ask uh, you to work with us as programs don't come out perfectly uh, in the very get go, but are needed, I think we apply that same type of uh, uh, respect to our local leaders as well. I may disagree with some of those decisions, but by the bottom line, We've got to work together to keep the maximum pressure on this virus, but we also have to find a way to reopen responsibly as well. I think that's key. Hey, thank you for that. I appreciate you, uh, you know, tackling that one. I'm, I'm going to give you uh, one last uh, question <laughs> here, a little, little easier to end this with, and, uh, and that's uh, can you just give us some good news? Yeah, well, yeah. So you're starting to see, I think, Nearly every business and organization knows how to reopen safely, both for their workers and for their customers as well. Uh, I think they're uh, excited about the chance, not just in Texas, but around the country to be able to do that. So I think this reopening is just in time and crucial to our success going forward. I, I like the fact Governor Abbott is doing it deliberately, cautiously, you know, in phases. Uh, although I think our overall, I am pretty hopeful he'll be able to accelerate some of those. I think that's key. The other good news um, is that while the numbers we're seeing, you know, unemployment for April will probably be 16%. We will have lost every new job we created in the past decade. These are depression era numbers, but don't be depressed. These are short term numbers. We headed into this with the strongest economy in the world, better position than others to ride this out. Fundamentally, still have those same strong foundations here. If you ask me, will the economy be stronger in this summer, in the third quarter and beyond? My answer is absolutely it will. It depends again on how well we keep this pressure on uh, how uh, smart a job we do in reopening. 
But yeah, I do expect to see jobs coming back and people going back to work. Uh, I do think our healthcare uh, system has shown it, it will not be overwhelmed. That was a huge issue early on. So yeah, I think, and if you look around, look around your own community, all the good things that are happening, people coming to the aid of nonprofits, first responders, people donating protective gear, food for organizations that need it. People are ordering out when they frankly don't need to just to support uh, their local restaurants. We put out a call in my congressional district a few weeks ago when it became clear that the businesses would need to ride to the rescue on these protective gears. So we asked in our nine counties, who, which businesses would stop your manufacturing to manufacture protective gear PPE that we need? In one day, we had 100 businesses raise their hand and say, we will stop what we're doing to manufacture what our country needs. Uh, it is, look, we have fought through and persevered through every challenge imaginable as a country. We always do it the same way, armed with American ingenuity, with know-how, with common sense. Uh, we are still the most blessed country on the world and I have no reason to believe that, that we won't do the same here uh, to persevere and persist. I think at the end of the day, we come out of this, not with the old normal, but with the new normal, in some ways a better one. We've learned an awful lot uh, in, this, uh, in this challenge uh, and we're gonna be able to apply it, I think in a positive way. So yeah, I have uh, an awful lot of optimism about where we go. This is what? still a key time, so. Terry, you there? I am, yeah. So uh, we just got one more question come in, and uh, <laughs> that's, uh, it, can you give us any insight or information about the potential meat shortage with the packing plants? Yeah, so you're, you're seeing, we just did a call with the Secretary of Agriculture and Ag Committees here uh, just the other day. <clears throat> Clearly, it's a challenge uh, if this meat packing and all uh, processing plants, you got to make sure that they're safe and they're healthy. And obviously the president knows how crucial this is, the supply chain. We're, we're seeing commodities being destroyed. We're seeing uh, pigs, pork, uh, cattle being destroyed. There's simply uh, no, no way to process them. Uh, and demand, of course, in, in many cases have fallen off the cliff. And so uh, it is a challenge. I feel like uh, it's starting to reopen, but it's, it's right now a pretty tough time for the ag community. As it is for the energy community, you know, this is, uh, we live in a region where all our neighbors are tied to the energy industry. It's been incredibly difficult for them. Um, I think we, I know that we ride this out. I think companies are being cautious about their layoffs, uh, knowing that their workforce is key to their rebound being hit both with Russian Saudis and then with the demand just falling off the cliff has been incredibly difficult. I'm confident as hard as it will be, we'll be able to ride this out as well. Thank you. Uh, that question came from uh, your friend, Danny Sullivan. So just wanted to point that out. He says, hello. Well, he and I are big meat eaters. So he's probably worried about He's probably worried about me and, and, and him as well. Tell Danny, hi, and look, um, there are still lots of challenges um, going forward. The Chamber of Commerce, the information you're providing to your businesses, the support you're giving the nonprofits, working with local elected leaders. Dan Crenshaw has been doing a terrific job in so many areas during this virus, but the fact that you keep such open communications with us makes it a lot easier for us to do our jobs knowing what your priorities are for our small business community uh, in, in how best to tackle them. So let's please uh, keep in touch. It's hugely helpful. Well, thanks again, Congressman Brady for participating in our virtual lunch in today. And thank you to everyone who's joined in our online meeting. I think we gained some valuable information and we truly appreciate it. And we are truly appreciative. Today's session was recorded and will be available to view and share. 
we'd like to remind you that we have our Humble BizCom Zoom meeting coming up on Thursday, May 21st. So please go to lakehouston.org to register for that meeting and hear updates from humble officials and community leaders. For all you young professionals, there'll be a yep virtual game night next Thursday, May 14th at 5 p.m. So all our young entrepreneurs and professionals age 21 to 45 ish, be sure to go to the chamber's online calendar and register to participate in the virtual game night. Once again, Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Great job, everybody. Thank you.